Well, it's good to see all of you here. My name's Tyrone, and uh, I'll just also welcome you to Bell Road Church. Thanks for joining us. And uh, it's just a, it's a fun week, and hopefully the holidays are going well for you so far. And now it's Christmas season. Can you believe it? It's Christmas. You excited? Hey? Are you ready for Christmas? Are you ready for the Christmas season? It's here. Ready or not, here it is. Uh, we're excited for Christmas, though. Next week here at Bell Road Church, we want to make sure you, you, you come back next week. Even if you're visiting family and you're here and you're, out, you're from out of town, come back next week. Okay, no excuses. Come back. Next week, we kick off our Christmas series, and we're calling it It's a Wonderful Life. Yeah. yeah. Maybe you've seen the movie. Maybe you've heard that phrase before. It is one of those movies that you have to watch every Christmas season, okay? Can I just share my opinion about that movie? Amazing, classic. You have to watch. If you've never watched this movie, you've got to. And so we're going to look at the Christmas narrative, the Christmas story over the next several weeks in Luke 1 and Matthew 1. It's going to be cool as we tie that into this phrase, it's a wonderful life. And so we're excited about all that we're going to be doing Christmas. We've got a kids program coming up in a few weeks. Lots of stuff going on that you heard about. It's all in your program. But I'd encourage you to be here every week for the Christmas series. And then I also want to encourage you to show up in January next year because we are uh, going to do something very special and very different. We're going to start a new tradition this January. We're calling it North Phoenix Family Month. We're going to make that month all about families. We want to make sure that the community knows that we believe in families. We're here for families. We want this to be a, a church that families can connect into and can raise their kids and be a part of for years and years and years and years and years and years. So it's going to be a, a focus on reaching out to families, and so we're going to have lots of fun with that in the month of January. So I just would encourage you all to be here as much as you possibly can every Sunday for the next two months as we have the Christmas season and then the January kick off the new year, and we do this, this family family focus thing. It's going to be great. We're excited about that. So since next week is the first message of the Christmas series, that means... But today is the end of our journey through the book of Acts. This Go Forth series that we started many, many moons ago is finally coming to an end. And today is actually part 27. We're in week 27 of this series. Now, I will say this. We've got one more that we're going to get to right after the Christmas series in between that and New Year's. And so this is the second to last, technically. It's the second to last of the Go Forth Series, But as I was bringing this to a close and thinking about all that we've learned, and it's been a long journey through the book of Acts, but so many amazing good stuff that we've learned. There's lots of things that are still on my heart and my mind for us as a church. We want to be a church like the book of Acts, and we want to see, uh, you know, the things that were, were important to them, we want to be important to us nowadays. Okay, it wasn't just for the first century church, but there's lots of things that are for us today And so one of the things that we looked at and wrestled with is, what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? What does it really mean to be a Christian? You know, we could have this very long definition and get into all the details of what that means, but simply put, this is kind of where we're at, this is how we're defining what it means to be a follower of Jesus, a Christian, is someone who is committed to following Jesus, who is being changed by Jesus, and is living on the mission of Jesus. And so when you and I say yes to Jesus, essentially... That's what we're saying yes to right there. I'm committed to following Jesus, which means you don't have to have this down perfectly, okay? None of us are perfect, right? And so it's not like I'm committing to be a perfect Christian life and to never sin again for the rest of my life, okay? That's not possible. But we can be committed to following Jesus no matter what. I'm just going to keep following him through the ups and the downs, my failures and all that, everything. I'm just going to keep following Jesus. I'm going to allow him to change me from the inside out. So it's this continual thing that he does to make me more like him. I'm being changed by Jesus, and I'm living on the mission of Jesus. What's that mission? It's to go forth, the gospel, right? So those were some of Jesus' last words, go and make disciples of all nations. And so today we're looking at some some last words that are uh, important last words. There's a Paul's last words to a church in Ephesus, but Jesus' last words essentially were, you know, go and make disciples. And then in the beginning of Acts, he gives us his very last words. He tells the disciples, hey, before, now before you go, go to Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit to fall on you. Okay, that was Acts 1-8 where Jesus is telling his, his friends that. And so through this whole journey through the book of Acts, starting with Acts chapter 1, verse 8 there, the disciples listen to Jesus. They go back to Jerusalem. Before starting the church, they wait to be clothed with power from on high. The Holy Spirit comes on them, and the Holy Spirit empowers them to birth the church. So this has been a fun journey as we've watched the church 
grow from, you know, 11 to essentially, you know, 130 in the upper room to thousands on that initial day of Pentecost, and it just takes over the city of Jerusalem. Then the Jewish leaders get upset. They start persecuting the church. Stephen's killed. The church scatters all across the region, but they take the gospel with them. So everywhere they go, the gospel goes. Churches are started, and so we've been having fun watching the church spread throughout, you know, what we would call the Middle East. And then uh, Saul, who was one of the guys persecuting the church, he gets radically saved. And so now he becomes one of the leading voices of the gospel, and he starts going on these missionary journeys, and that's what we've been looking at for the last two and a half months, three months almost, is Paul's missionary journeys as he travels here and here and here and here and all over Asia Minor and the Mediterranean Sea and Greece and all that kind of stuff. And so it's been quite a journey, but what we see is it all started and continued with this empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And you see the overarching theme within the book of Acts. Acts of the Apostles is what it's technically called, but we could probably more accurately call it the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because it's really the Holy Spirit empowering the church to be the church. And so that's one of the big themes we see all throughout the book of Acts. I dare you to read through the book of Acts and try taking out the parts of the Holy Spirit. Jesus thought it was a big deal. He's like, I can't be with you all everywhere I go, uh, and I've done my part. Now it's time for you to do your part. And the disciples are like, I don't know, Jesus is kind of working out pretty good. Haven't you noticed? Like, people are getting, you know, healed, and thousands of people are getting, you know, listening to you and your teachings, and you're feeding thousands, and this is pretty cool, Jesus. And Jesus is like, no, the next phase of the journey is for you guys to lead the way, but I'm going to be with you because I am sending my spirit, Jesus said. And so we see that, yes, it all centers around Jesus and his work on the cross, his death and resurrection, but Jesus and his spirit to empower us to live this out. And he did it for the church, and so we learn that that's an important thing for us as well. And one of the convictions I have continued to come back to throughout this series for for all of us, even myself included, is that as followers of Jesus, I think we find ourselves too often not very spiritual. We're not spiritual enough. Here we are supposedly spiritual people, we serve a supernatural spiritual God who by his spirit has empowered us, who the Holy Spirit, God himself, lives inside of us, yet we find ourselves not really living spiritual lives. And I think that shouldn't be the case. Our lives are explained too easily. But we want to live inexplicable lives. The only explanation for your life would be God must be living inside of you. God must be real because of what I see you doing and how I see you living. There must be be a God. And you're like, yeah, that's right. He lives inside of me and he wants to live inside of you. Okay, so we need the Holy Spirit to help us to live spiritual lives. We want to be people of the Spirit, not people of the flesh. The old term that we used to use years ago was carnal Christianity. You ever remember that? We don't want to be carnal Christians. We want to be Spirit-filled, Spirit-empowered Christians. And you see that all throughout the book of Acts and all those you know, the ways that, that the Holy Spirit empowered them to start the church, lots of miracles that we read, which, again, by the way, didn't happen like every single day. These are just highlights of stories that took place throughout their life. And so we want these things to, to happen, though, in our life, in the life of our church. And so there's so much we can learn from this as we come to a close. Uh, but today is, you know, like I said, the second to last day of this series. And we're going to look at an interesting what I would call one-day leadership conference that Paul puts on for a bunch of church leaders. And Paul is so, like, passionate about making sure he connects with his friends that lead the church in Ephesus one last time. He doesn't go to Ephesus, but he's traveling back to Jerusalem. This is the very end of his third missionary journey, his last missionary journey. And On his way back, he's in this town called Miletus, and he's like, man, I got to talk to the church leaders of Ephesus. So he's not going to go to Ephesus, but he sends for the church leaders to come to him. And so they have to walk for two days to come and meet with Paul. But the fact that Paul would do that shows you this was a big deal to Paul, right? He's like, I got some things that I got to make sure I I continue to to teach them and to, to share with them. And these essentially are Paul's last words, his parting words to these friends that he deeply cares about about. And last words are important, right? Don't you agree? Yeah. Very important. You remember, you remember people for their last words, and so these would have been the words that they remembered from Paul. I was looking up some famous last words this week, and uh, Charlie Chaplin, he, this was after a priest read him his last rites, and the priest said, may the Lord have mercy on your soul, and Charlie Chaplin, he said, why not? After all, it belongs to him. 
which is good last words to say before you enter eternity, right? So his very last words were, my soul does belong to, to God. Okay, Jack Daniel is famous for these last words. One last drink, please. Which is fitting, you would say, right? Okay, for that guy. Those were his last words before he stepped into eternity. Uh, John Jacob Astor, he said, the ladies have to go first. Goodbye, dearie, I'll see you later. He said to his wife, who was boarding a lifeboat on the Titanic, as he gave up his seat for other ladies and went to help other ladies, but that was the last words that she ever heard her husband speak. And so she definitely remembered those words. Remember these words from Todd Beamer? Are you guys ready? Let's roll. He was on United Flight 93 on that crazy 9-11 day. And some of you may remember, he was a part of that team, allegedly. Now, those words were left on a voicemail to his family. So those were the last words they heard from him via voicemail. Uh, but then, uh, apparently, uh, him and a bunch of guys took over the plane. And the guys that hijacked the plane, they took those guys over and saved lots of other people's lives. Unfortunately, that plane didn't make it. So other famous last words. And, of course, we can't forget Jesus' famous last words, right? Go, go forth and make disciples. Okay, so... We're going to look at Jesus' last words, but before we do, let me talk about first words, because these are words that you and I want to hear God say to us that moment we step into eternity and we're standing before our maker. We want to hear him say, in fact, this is what I'm saying here today, is this is, this is the big idea for the whole message. This is the number one goal of, of our life, is that we would hear God say in the end, well done, good and faithful servant. When you step into eternity and you stand before your maker, that's the goal that you and I would hear these words. Well done, good and faithful servant. Now, if you're a goal setter, like I am, I'm big on goals. If you know me, I talk about goals. I encourage people to make goals. I think it's, they're good for you. They help you go further than maybe you wouldn't have gone had you not had goals. Don't get me started on goal setting, all right? <laughs> but if you set goals, I, I, I'm proud of you. I encourage you to do that. Maybe you have great goals, like maybe you want to climb Mount Kilimanjaro someday. Awesome. Go for it. Maybe you want to run a marathon. You're crazy, but that's a great goal. People who run that, I give props to. Okay, maybe someday you want to make it on Sports Center. That was one of my lifelong goals, and I did it a few years ago. It was amazing. Maybe you want to, uh, I don't know, maybe you... Uh, there's so many life goals. Maybe you want to see the pyramids in Egypt. There's lots of places you want to visit. Those can be good life goals, you know. I want to, you know, I want to visit this place. I want to go this place, you know. Maybe you want to be uh, on a different show, not Sports Center, but like Oprah. Or you just want to meet Oprah someday or I don't know. There's so many, so many great goals we could have. I guess that's the point, right? I just want to encourage you to put this at the very top of the list. Your number one goal of life should be to hear God say in the end, well done, good and faithful servant, Right? So, Acts chapter 20 is where we're at. Verse 17. And I am calling this Paul's leadership training conference that he's having for the church leaders of Ephesus, okay? Uh, because that's essentially what it is. He doesn't meet with all the believers in the church of Ephesus, just the leadership. And so, what I'd like to do is just kind of talk to you as if you're leaders here today. Is that okay if I do that? Because I think you all are. Okay, leadership in its truest, simplest definition would be influence. We all have the power and ability to influence people, don't we? You're going to go home, and you're going to influence people. You're influencing people right now by your attentiveness or lack thereof, whatever you're at in that whole <laughs> spectrum. As you leave this place and you go to the grocery store or a restaurant, you're going to influence people you come in contact with, okay? So that's leadership. And so I'm going to speak to you as leaders. Maybe you're lead, leading a few people. Maybe you're leading lots of people. But we can learn a lot regardless of where we're at. In, in life, we can learn a lot from this message that Paul gives to the church leaders that I'm calling really a, a, like this one-day leadership training conference that he holds. Now, I believe that Paul did a great job establishing the leadership in Ephesus. He spent three years with these guys. These were near and dear friends to him. Three years. Now he's been gone for about a year, and so now he wants to see these guys again. And he wants to give them these last words that he has. But the church in Ephesus, for the next 100 to 200 years, really becomes the center of Christianity for the Roman Empire. So Paul did a great job establishing leadership in the church in the city. And you can see uh, that throughout what took place in, in the generations after Paul left. So, again, Paul is thinking this is very important, so he calls for his friends. Verse 17, chapter 20 of Acts is where we're at. 
from Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. Okay, pause. Remember, Paul's on his way back to Jerusalem. Last missionary journey, he's on his way home. This one sentence doesn't seem very significant, but these guys had to walk for two days to get from Ephesus to Miletus. Okay, so just remember that as you read that verse. That one sentence. Verse 18 says, when they arrived, he said to them, welcome to my leadership conference. Let us now begin. You know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears, although I was severely tested by the plots of the Jews. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. Okay, so we'll stop right there. There's four sections that I see Paul teaching these leaders from the church of Ephesus. Let me just give all four of them to you, then we'll talk about this first one here. First one is he's basically saying in that section we read right there, hey, make sure you live with the servant's heart. So this is what I strive to do. I want you to live with the servant's heart. The second thing, the next section will be counting the costs of discipleship. The third one is protect the church. And the fourth one is he commissioned the leaders to live generously. And so those are the overarching themes we see within these next 18 verses. I think this is an 18-verse synopsis of the whole big teaching that Paul gave to these leaders. And so Luke, who's recording the book of Acts, probably just gave us just the, the short, shorter version. This is kind of the, the themes, though. Maybe he had four breakout sessions throughout the day, and this was the themes of that. I don't know. It's what it kind of seems like. But the first one is, like we just read there, live with the servant's heart. In verse 19, he says, I I serve the Lord with great humility. That was my desire. I wanted to be a servant of God. How do you know when someone has a true servant's heart? How do you know? They really, really, really are a servant. And, And my answer to that would be when it gets hard to serve and they keep the same heart. That's when you know they truly have a servant's heart. This is how Paul lived. He said, in my heart of God, I faced opposition from the Jews, but I kept serving and doing what God had called me to do. You know what I've learned is that it's easy to serve when it's easy. Duh, right? But it's true. It's funny how everyone wants to help out and serve when it's easy, but can you serve when it gets hard? When it gets tough, can you keep serving? That's when you have a true servant's Heart, You know, like uh, that saying, when the going gets tough, the tough get going, right? Hey, when the servant gets tough, the, the, the true servants keep serving. They keep going. They don't, they don't quit. And so Paul essentially is saying that, hey, guys, I want this to be a part of your heart. Be servants. This is how I strive to live no matter how hard it got. I wanted to make sure that I served and I, I just kept preaching the same message. And he, he says, I, I preach anything that would be helpful to people. But obviously, it's centered around the key components of the gospel, because he, he keys in on that right after that. He talks about how he, he preached, uh, repent of your sins and make sure you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? And I would say that that's a very helpful message, wouldn't you? As far as helpful messages go, that would go to the top of the list. Like, uh, the gospel is the most helpful message we could ever preach to people. And so he's like, I just wanted to preach words that were helpful. I'm like, that's, you, you hit the bullseye, Paul. Good job. That was it. The gospel, because that changes people's lives, like for all of eternity. So that's, that's a good, helpful message, way to go. But Paul, in a sense, is doing what God had called him to do. He just was using his gifts and living out his calling. That's all he was doing. And it's important you and I all do the same thing, right? One of the ways I get to serve our church and serve people on a regular basis is I get to stand up in front of people and I get to preach the word. I get to open up the word, I get to teach, and I get to preach. And I love that. It's an honor, it's a privilege, but this is one way that I serve right here. And it takes lots of preparation. Anyone who stands up here, any of our our pastors, anyone who who speaks, obviously they've studied for a long time. And so all of that is part of serving. And then I get up and I get to serve in, in this capacity. And I love that. But this is me using my gift. The truth is we all have gifts. We're all called to use all of our gifts to serve God. And Jesus talked about this. Parable of the talents. Three guys were given talents. One guy buried his talents. The other two multiplied their talents. And when the master showed up again, uh, the two guys that multiplied their talents, Jesus had these words. The master had these words for him. He said, well done, good and faithful servant. He said, come and share in your master's happiness. And so the point of that parable was that Jesus was saying, 
Make sure you use your talents. Use your gifts. Don't bury them. The guy that buried his talents, this is what was said to him. You wicked and lazy servant. Then it said, throw that worthless servant out into the darkness. Those are the words of the master. We don't want those words to be said of us. We want to hear the words as we faithfully use our gifts and our talents. We want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, right? Come and share in your master's happiness. Because remember, that's the number one goal in life. You want to hear God say that to you in the end. Well done, good and faithful servant. So it all centers around, and the parable centers around you and I being faithful servants of Jesus. So it's a good question to ask yourself. Am I, am I being a faithful servant in my life? Am I being a faithful servant at work and at, at school and, and at home? Am I a faithful servant of Jesus in all those areas of my life? I think that's a great question for you to ask yourself. All right, let's go on to the next section. Jump to verse 22. And it says, Paul speaking, says, I am now compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Remember what he's talking about here is counting the, co- the cost of discipleship. Paul is saying, hey, the Holy Spirit's leading me, and he's been leading me, and, and everywhere I go, he, he reminds me of, you know, you're, you're called to go here, but he also speaks of hardships that I'm going to face, yet even when he knows that, Paul says, I'm still willing to go. I'm going to go. This following Jesus thing isn't a promise to a life of ease and a life of comfort. You ever heard that phrase, salvation is free, but it'll cost you your life, and it's so true, Right? I'm thankful that salvation is free. You and I don't have to do anything to earn it. We just got to receive the free gift of salvation. Now, the truth is, it's not technically free because it was paid for. It just wasn't paid for by you and me. Jesus paid for it on the cross. He died on the cross for our sins, the sins that we commit, that we rebelled against God and said, God, I'm going to do my own thing. Okay, that's sin. And then we recognize, man, I've sinned, but Jesus, you took my sins on the cross. You died for me in my place. And now as I recognize what you did for me and ask for forgiveness, our relationship is, is made whole and, and it's free. You're like, this is amazing. Thank you, Jesus, for doing that for me. And so Jesus is saying, yeah, it's, it's free for you. I, I paid everything for that. So salvation is free for us, but it still costs us our life because there's a cost to following Jesus. We're called to follow him and surrender everything. We're, we're called to radical obedience to Jesus. And so this, in a sense, are the words that Paul's reminding these guys. Hey, count the cost of disciples. There's a cost, but it's worth it. You're going to face hardships. I know I'm going to face hardships. I, the Holy Spirit's still speaking to me, hardships I'm going to face, and some of the things I don't even know yet, but I do know, in the end, it is always worth it, because to follow Jesus means that you're still in the truth. Whether it's easy or hard, you're in the truth, and to be in that place is always, always worth it, Right? So we can know that intellectually, but it's, it's harder to live it out, right? It's, it's like so many things in life. It's hard to live it out. But Paul, I think, gives us a secret. How do you live this thing out? How do you be a true disciple, a follower of Jesus, no matter how hard it gets? In verse 24, he gives us what I would call a secret or a key. He says, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. Okay, so... What Paul is not saying is, he's not saying, hey, uh, I don't really care about life. I just want to make sure I follow Jesus. Not saying that, right? He's not saying, oh, life's not really that big deal. Just make sure you believe in Jesus, and then whatever happens, happens. Okay, again, not saying that at all. What Paul is saying is this. He's saying, I'm finding my life's value based upon faithfully following Jesus and doing what he's called me to do. That's where I find value in life. So where do you find your value? Because we're looking for value with our life, right? We're looking for it out of success. If I'm successful, I feel valuable. My life has value. We look, you know, from relationships and money to you know, so many things in life. Am I recognized? Popularity. So many things that we feel like gives us value. Like my life is, is valuable now because of this, but all those things we lose eventually. And so we got to make sure that our value is centered around Jesus, and faithfully following him and doing what he's called us to do. 
That's what Paul is saying. My life is valuable because I, it's all about using the gifts that he's given me, and I'm just going to finish the race and complete the task that God has given me. Those are the words he's using there. That's why my life has value. I consider my life worth nothing, but it's worth a lot because I'm doing what God has called me to do. That's what he's saying. I want to faithfully live this thing out. Okay, so it just reminds us again of this. The number one goal of our life is to hear God say in the end, what? Well done, good and faithful servant. So Paul's saying, I want to live that way. Okay, let's go on to the next section. Starting with verse 25. Leadership breakout number three, protect the church. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. And tears begin to go down their face because they like each other a lot. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Again, Paul is saying to these leaders, your job is to protect the church. The Holy Spirit has entrusted you with the church. Protect them, oversee them, and guard them. Be on your guard and watch out for, you know, false teachers. People are going to come in and teach, you know, false doctrine. People who are going to deceive. People are going to cause division. You got to make sure that you protect the church. And I'm sure he went into some of his thoughts that we read about at other places on church discipline. Sometimes you got to step in and bring some correction and bring some guidance to people and work through issues with people. And I'm sure he talked about all of that. But this is, again, is just a brief synopsis. And in this, Paul uses the same analogy that Jesus used. He calls us sheep, and we need a shepherd. And so he's saying, hey, guys, you as leaders, you're shepherds. Watch your flock. Guard it. Protect it. Because when I go, there's going to be some savage wolves. Just like in you know, real sheep flocks, savage wolves try to come in and take out the sheep. Okay, that's going to happen to the church. And so you got to be on your guard for those savage wolves. Interesting words, huh? Savage wolves. Okay, I look, what does that mean? I looked it up and it means an oppressive person. Watch out for those oppressive people. They don't come and bring freedom. They bring oppression. Savage can literally be translated this. It, it, it means heavy, of great weight, burdensome, troublous, and difficult. Okay, that all brings into the meaning and the weight of a savage wolf. And Paul says this is going to happen, not just from outside the church, but people even from inside the church will do this as well. So be on your guard. And so for you and I, how do we be on our guard today? Because we need to be on our guard today. How do we watch out for the savage wolves today? In fact, how do you even recognize? How do you even know there's a, they're, they're a savage wolf? How would you recognize a savage wolf? Well, the simple answer to that would be by their fruit. What fruit's coming out of their life? What fruit do you see out of the ministry of what they're doing? Is it, is it confusion? Are they helping people or putting people down? Are they building people up? Are they bringing division to the church or are they building the church up? Okay, do you feel confused after they talk to you? Are they bringing hurt or are they bringing healing into people's lives and into the church? Okay, so those fruit is how you would recognize them. Okay, Jesus' words in Matthew 7 are this. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Now let's just pause and, and take a moment to be real and honest. Any single one of us in this room could be a savage wolf at points in our life. We're not immune to this. We're not immune to sin still. And so hurt and bitterness can creep into any of us and cause us to hurt other people. I've seen it happen with some of the nicest, godliest people where they were hurt, they were offended, they took up offense, they got bitter. Bitterness just grew deep inside of them and, and, and through that they began to hurt other people. And so if we're not careful, we can allow ourselves to go there and we can do things that aren't pleasing to God. 
and they aren't helping other people. So how do you avoid that? How do you make sure you don't go there? Well, I just want to encourage you to make sure that everything you do centers around a love for God and a love for people. That's why Jesus narrowed down all the commandments. It's really all about this. Love God and love people. So you want your behavior to be motivated by a love for God and a love for people. Hopefully that motivates you. Not a motivation for, I have to have justice, or people need to know what's going on, or, you know, that's not, the motivation is a love for God and a love for people. You heard that phrase, hurt people, hurt people? Yeah, it's true, unfortunately, isn't it? And again, we could all go there. But I can't, out of my hurt, turn and hurt other people. And we probably all have done that, and we've probably all been hurt by other people because they were hurt. And it wasn't anything that we did wrong, but they hurt us based on, upon their hurt. Because hurt people do hurt people. That's why we got to be careful and make sure that our love for God and our love for people is driving our behavior. And if you're not sure how you're living this out, then I'd encourage you to ask somebody close to you. You can also ask Jesus this question. Ask yourself, uh, what would God say of my behavior right now? Is my behavior something that would produce God to say in the end, well done, good and faithful servant? Is the behavior of my life right now something that would produce those words from God in the end? Because I always want to think with the end in mind, guys. Today, I am one day closer to all of eternity. Today, how I live my life is pointing me in one direction or the other. I want to point it in the direction where I'm going to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant, right? Amen? Okay, so number four. Jesus uh, commissioned the leaders to live generously. And let's look at these, these verses here. Verse 32, he says this. Now I commit to you, commit, commit sorry, let me try that again. <laughs> I butchered that sentence. <laughs> I, sorry, now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. And everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So, Paul in other places taught, you know, that, you know, pastors is good for them to, you know, be paid for what they do in the church context. But what he's saying for himself, he's like, I supported myself in my ministry to you guys all these years. And, you know, you watch me do this. And so Paul was a tent maker. So that was his side job that supported his ministry habit where he could proclaim the gospel and plant churches. And so Paul is saying, this is how I did this, to support myself and take care of myself. And even in the midst of that, he's like, I didn't covet what other people had. They had gold and silver and, you know, the clothes that they had. I didn't covet. I didn't get caught up chasing what they had. I just made sure I focused in on what I had and what God had called me to do. And so these guys hearing these words, they'd be like, yeah, we saw you live this out. And so Paul is saying, I live this, but I'm, in, I'm really encouraging you. As I commission you to go back and lead the church, this church that I care so much about in your city, live generously. Be generous people in all that you do. Don't get caught up going after worldly wealth and all this other stuff. Be generous people. Don't get caught up chasing after the Joneses. Don't get caught up and think it's all about this. I have to have this. And if I don't have this, then I, I'm missing out. And because they have that and my kids have to have this and all this, you know. And you don't get caught up in all that. You know, it's funny. I read this tweet this week that I uh, thought was hilarious. You know, only in America would we have a day where we have Thanksgiving and we're thankful for everything that we have, followed by a day called Black Friday where we run over people and chase after things we don't have. Because we need to have that. We got to have it, okay? So it's the day after, right? Thankfulness, gone. Black Friday, great deals we can get on Black Friday. It's awesome. It just totally destroys the whole Thanksgiving weekend, it seems like, right? Thankfulness? Is this a picture of thankfulness? Huh, maybe not. <laughs> so I laughed at that tweet. I thought it was funny because it was, it's true. You know, how do we live generously? It really starts with being thankful for, with what we have and not coveting what we don't have. But I want to commission you to be generous people with your life. Live a generous life. Look for ways that you can help people, you can serve people, you can be a blessing to people. You got that blessed strategy in your program, right? Was that, that was put in there today. Got that blessed strategy. It's a great way to 
to be generous. We got a couple other things going on that we've talked about here. We've got the toy drive. Uh, I saw the box out there in the lobby. It's full. That's awesome. So we'll empty that and get ready to use those and have it ready for more toys that'll be coming in. Um, but we also have this adopt a classroom thing. Those are just ways that you and I could be generous this Christmas season. And we got one more opportunity for you. And to share this, I'm going to invite our friend Skylar to the front. There she is. I saw you somewhere. You moved. Okay. Come on up here, Skylar. And she's going to help introduce one other thing that we can practically do. Because she had this really cool idea that you've been doing for a few years. And she told Amy about it a couple weeks ago. And so I was thinking this really fit into the message today because this is very generous of you. So uh, can you just real briefly just tell us uh, what is it and where would you get this idea? It's like homeless care packages that you can keep in your car so when you pass people, like homeless people on the side of the road, you can give it to them. So it's pretty much just like water bottles, food, toothbrush, toothpaste, combs, just so that they can like make sure they're clean. And I got this idea just because like homeless people always like got my heart, like because my mom, like whenever we passed by, I'd ask to give them money, but she like always explained the risks of like giving them money. So I, I wanted to find a new way to help them. That's great. So in your words, why do you think it's important for us to do something like this? Just to like show God's love to people who aren't, haven't been showed it before because they don't have anyone to show them. So just by helping them and giving them like, there's a little booklet in there that shows like the summary of like the Bible. So it kind of just shows like God's love in a way they've never been shown before. So you've put all these packages together. We almost ran out for a service. You yeah. went back. Did you go back and make a few more? I did make So we don't have very many. So how do you want us to, uh, how do you want us to use these? How would you encourage us to use these? Um, just whenever you see someone on the side of the road, just take a second and give them one. Simple as that, huh? Yes. Okay, take a second. Just, pull, just stop right in the middle of Bell Road. <laughs> take a second. Mm -hmm. Tell everyone to wait. Yep. And do it. Okay, just like that. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Skylar. You are awesome. Give her a hand. Isn't that cool? One of our own teenagers right there, and that's super cool. That's what a generous thing to do, right? And so when you leave this morning, you can grab a few. We've got a few left. She made a few more because we almost ran out for service. And she's going to try. I forgot to ask you, but maybe bring some more next week, maybe. Yeah, we have some more next week. And is this another thing that you and I can do to just be generous? And I love the generosity that's in your heart there, Skylar. And uh, that really challenges us. But also, it just gives us a great opportunity to have something practical that we can do in that. So lots of things we can learn from Paul's leadership teaching, right, guys? Hey, live with the servant's heart. Count the cost of discipleship. Protect the church. It's something we can all do. We can all do that, right? And he commissioned the leaders to live generously, and so I just want to commission you to do the same. Live generous lives. And the overarching theme of all of this is really this, guys. We want to live a life where we hear God say to us in the end, well done, good and faithful servant. That's the goal, right? That's the goal. So make sure you live today in a way that if it happened at the end of the day, God would look at you and say, well done, good and faithful servant. I think it's good for us to live today as if it were our last, live every day as if it were your last, because we never know when that's going to come. Never know, right? You and I are living a life that's pointing us one of two directions, so make sure it's pointing that direction. I'm going after these words. I just want to be a faithful servant of God with everything that I do, with all the goals that I have that I aspire to achieve and accomplish and do with my life, the top of the list is, in the end, no matter what happens, I want to hear God say that to me. Well done, good and faithful servant. Why don't you stand to your feet? And we're going to pray. I hope this helps you. I hope you get something out of this. It's just a, a fun little one-day leadership conference that Paul had for some church leaders in Ephesus, but man, these, these words still ring true for us and apply to us today. So we're going to take some time. We're going to worship and um, we're going respond to respond to Jesus. So I'd love for you to close your eyes right now. Let's just take a moment. We're just going to pause. God, I know that there's things you already are, are speaking to us and maybe you still want to speak to every single one of us. 
in how do we respond to this message? God, what do we need to do? Some of us, Lord, we've lost light of eternity. We, we don't think about making you the one we're passionately pursuing and so that we can hear those words, faithful servant at the end, Lord. So I pray that today that you would help us, stir up in us a motivation, a desire, a strong desire to be a faithful servant of you today in everything that we do. Lord, some of us, we need your love to be what, what drives our behavior and motivates our behavior. Lord, I pray a love for you and a love for people would be what, what drives us. Lord, there's some that are here that need a relationship with you. They need hope from you. They need forgiveness and to receive the free gift of salvation. And Lord, I pray for those. Lord, that today would be a day that they could realize that their sins drove you to the cross, but if they believe in what you did for them on the cross, they can have this free gift of salvation that brings forgiveness and freedom and all your grace and your love and purpose and direction and an eternal relationship with you. In fact, if that's you here today and you say, I realize I need to do that, Tyrone, today's my day, November 25th, 2018. Today's the day I need to say yes to Jesus. I want to put my faith and trust in him I really want to follow him for the rest of my life. If that's you, go ahead and slip your hand up right now because we want to take a moment. We're going to pray. We're going to solidify this decision for you in your life. If you're here this morning, say, that's me, Tyron. Just slip up your hand right now. Maybe it's a rededication. Maybe it's uh, for the first time. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Say, that's me, Tyron. I, I, I need to. we all come to you right now and we're all thankful for what you've done for us on the cross. Today again, Jesus, every single one of us, we need your forgiveness. Lord, forgive us of our sins and our rebellion against you and, and trusting ourselves over trusting you. And forgive us of putting other things above you and instead of putting you first. And so right now we put you first in our life and we want to live for you and follow you. Jesus, all of us to ultimately want to be faithful servants of yours. So I pray Again, Holy Spirit, that you would move, that you would speak, that you would direct all of us and direct these last moments together. In Jesus' name.